Come and dream with me. Hello, welcome to What Do You Want to Watch? The Explosion Network's premier media podcast. Every fortnight, we get together to talk about movies, TV, and online content, and help you answer the question: Who would have expected an envelope would become the biggest talking point on the, in the pop culture world this last past week? Not me, but you know, here we are. Paul Rod meme. Uh, I'm your host Ashley Hubley. Joining me today, Dylan Blight. I don't get it. Wait, you didn't? You don't know about Envelope Gate? Oh, is this a live wild thing? Yeah. Okay, yeah. I don't know what the the gate part is, but what's the gate part? So, so she's on at CinemaCon, which we'll talk about later. Uh, doing yeah. talking. About like, I know the story, but what's the like? Why are they calling because it? Because it's like it's a totally random thing that somebody did. Someone served her papers yeah, it's, from it is random. Circus yeah. at <laughs> at CinemaCon. He had a full badge and accreditation to do it to to be at CinemaCon. And like people are freaking out about how this happened. I guess he just committed to his job. You know but how how much planning beforehand would you have had to do? Like when was the cutoff for like going to CinemaCon? You just covered all these, uh, you know. He just brought a ticket for all the conventions in case you turn up. I don't know. It is weird. Yeah, that's what it is. It was a very weird story. <laughs> uh, that, you know, caught, captured people's imaginations for at least a little while. All right. On today's episode, we'll be discussing watching now, watch history. We'll be talking about some news, including what would happen at CinemaCon, giving some thumbs to some trailers, and talking about this week's top three. Uh, Dylan, how about I let you kick it off with, you know, your favorite show, Back. Better Call Saul. Better Call Saul. The Back final the f- season. Final season. Part one. Yeah, they're doing a Stranger Things. <laughs> um, I mean, look, so we're three episodes in. As of no, this comes yeah, as of recording. Um, it's phenomenal. I feel like, look, at this stage, I usually wait until a show's finished to say, you know, like give it the. The full look back. Did it wrap up well enough? Did it ruin itself in the finale? I have full faith that this show won't. So, yeah. I mean, I think it was around season three or four where I was like, you know, this show could be better than Breaking Bad. No, we're at the point where this show is definitively better than Breaking Bad. And, of course, I'm not shitting on Breaking Bad. Breaking Bad is one of my favorite shows of all time. But I definitely feel like Better Call Saul is just, like, they took everything they learned from that show, especially, you know, by the time these people got the the core, you know, writing producers everyone just got so much better at telling story that by the time they get to this show they're just so much better at it and you get this uh phenomenal product where it isn't it isn't about breaking bad it isn't a spin-off for the sake of a spin-off even though they've confirmed that um uh fucking brian cranston and aaron paul i forgot his name for a second i'm so sorry brian cranston and aaron paul apparently showing up this season at some point that was already uh revealed which i don't know why that needs to happen but um we shall see how that goes, but yeah, the, the, the reason this show is so good is because the character of Jimmy McGill was from the get go so much more interesting than he sort of had any right to be based on how he was in Breaking Bad, which was just a, a slimy screwball lawyer. Um, that was very entertaining as a side supporting character, but when they announced they were going to do a spin off, it was like, how could this character carry a, a story? And it was because they worked backwards. They, cra- they crafted such a, um, a great and unique background and story for him, but it's all the side characters that are being introduced and seeing how their stories are playing out. Um, and going to wrap up. And I still, there's a bunch that, um, have or are about to, I guess, and they're going to look to cap off some storylines and whatever else as we move to towards the finale of um, this this show. Um, but yeah, there's a bunch of other characters that we still don't know exactly where they are because they're not in Breaking Bad or never hear about them again. Um, and then the most interesting thing, again, I'm just not talking specifics for spoilers who for people who may not start season yet or whatever. Um, but the uh each season previously would start with the with a black and white uh bit at the start of the season which was actually taking place after breaking bad so it's with soul slash jimmy post breaking bad where he's sort of 
pretending to be this other character in like this uh, donut shop or whatever. It's like a Wendy's or I can't remember what it's called. But um, these always played out, these sort of black and white vignettes showing you what's happening. And the thing was always like, well, by the time we reach the finale of this show, I wonder how much we'll see of those. Interestingly, this season doesn't start with a black and white um, vignette to look forward at what's happening to the character. So it just makes me wonder if we're going to spend a bit more time in the the fres- future or present or however you want to look at it of the Breaking Bad universe timeline some point here. Um, but yeah, no. Bra- uh, Better Call Saul is one of the best shows on television consistently. Definitely been one of my favorite shows and I'm very keen to see how everything wraps up in the next uh, 13 weeks. I think it's 16 episodes or something like that this season. So yeah, keen, keen, keen. Well, there's, Great. A br- there's a break, right? So. That's true. So over like, the next, I don't know, over the next few months, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of this year, I don't know. Forever, who knows? It's, it's good, good to have something weekly to watch that I know will be fantastic. You know, Time to look I consistently to know that there's always going to be an episode of a TV show I can look forward to watching that I know is going to be great, and that's what this yeah. show is. All right. Uh, so I've been to cinema a few times this week. Uh, I went and saw The Northman, the latest film from. Uh, the Witch and Lighthouse director Robert Eggers, uh, in which uh, Alexander Skarsgård plays Amleth, uh, a young Viking prince whose brother, whose father is brutally murdered in front of him by his uncle uh, as a child and is sworn uh, to avenge his father, save his mother, and to kill his uncle. <laughs> if you've seen the trailer, he like it's a it's a thing. Um, so this is actually based on the legend of Amleth, which was a Viking folk tale, or you know could have been a real person. But that was the inspiration for Hamlet for William Shakespeare. So if you've seen Hamlet, any version of Hamlet or The Lion King, you probably have a good idea of where this story is going. Um, I really enjoyed it. I think I gave it a nine over on the web, over on explosionnetwork.com and said engaging from start to finish. Robert Eggers delivers a fantastic Viking epic that is bigger than anything he's done to date, but loses none of his vision he's displayed in his previous films. Unlike anything else being released in cinemas at the moment, the Northman is well worth your time and money to see on the big screen. I think you know it is a very dark and like uh, brooding film to a degree. Like uh, Amleth is not exactly a person you can you he's not like a super he's not your captain america like hero that you can like get, go along with like one of the opening scenes is he's become part of like a viking raiding group and they like attack a like village and once they finish pillaging him he like sits by as the other vikings like round up all the weak people that they can't like s- become slaves and children and stuff chuck him in a house and like set that house on fire so i mean it's it's a <laughs> he's not someone you can exactly root for straight away uh it's not the rating you see in uh, assassin's creed no uh, <laughs> like full on Valhalla. Yeah. The, this is very robert Eggers is very well known for being very authentic uh mm-hmm. and historically accurate uh so this is very much the case here uh but yeah obviously you know he gets wind that his uncle is his Lost the kingdom that he stole from Amleth as a kid, uh, and has gone up to like Iceland. So he smuggles his way there, pretends to be a slave, uh, and kind of infiltrates his uncle's village and like goes about making his life a living hell. As he, uh, as you learn, he's been fated that this is something that is definitely going to happen. It's like, um, yeah. Really interesting, uh, very violent at times. Like, there is some pretty gory shit that happens in here. Uh, it, it's definitely a film that doesn't, like, hold your hands a lot. It's like, even though you you have a general idea of where it's going, it doesn't give much explanations as to why th- certain things are happening and that kind of stuff. Uh, fantastic cast across the board. Nicole Kidman is one of the best monologues of the year. Uh, like, astounding. Uh, really impressive. Um, like, great sword play. Uh, it's like, yeah, fantastic. I really enjoyed it. You know, if you can go see it, go see it. Uh, so that's the Northman playing in cinemas now. Also went and saw After Yang. So this is the latest film from, uh, director Koganada, I want to say, uh, who did previously Columbus, which can't find anywhere, can't watch anywhere, can't, 
can't download, can't stream, can't rent, can't buy anywhere here in Australia as far as I can tell. Uh, so that's disappointing. But yeah, this is a film set in a future in which, you know, there's AI beings and that kind of stuff. Um, a not too distant scientific future, science fiction future, uh, in which you know, uh, Colin Farrell plays a father of a young adopted Chinese girl uh, named Mika uh, and is as part of their re- thinking is to help raise Mika uh, and keep her in touch with her heritage. Uh, Colin Farrell's character and his wife played by Jodie Turner-Smith, um, they bought a robot uh, that was classified as Asian to help raise Mika and like, from a company called Second Sibling. So, like, they have a second sibling to help transition, help with the raising of the child, whatever. Um, during <laughs> the opening credits, in which they are doing, competing in, like, a family dance synchronization competition, uh, Yang, the robot, stops working. Uh, and, you know, it's a, the story kind of follows them, uh, the, you know, trying to get him repaired and then learning that he is a special model who had a special camera installed in him that was taking cap capturing like three second moments every day and that kind of stuff uh and then colin farrell kind of looks into his memories and that kind of stuff it's, it's very a very contemplative film it's not like a super plot heavy movie um very much of a reflective movie on you know, what it means to live, what it means to be human, um, kind of, it is, you know, it's, it's kind of this movie where these, these characters are kind of grieving this, this robot who's come, become part of their family and like, uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it. It's like, it is very, it's like 93 minutes. It's, it's pretty short. Uh, but I think it, it, it is particularly in, emotive and like made me feel good and like it's interesting because i was like oh this would be a perfect chaser to the movie uh me earl and the dying girl which kind of hits similar themes or a certain similar theme in that movie um i thought he was gonna say frank no <laughs> maybe i don't i don't yeah <laughs> frank did frank i i remember talking about frank but frank didn't no <laughs> didn't quite remote you know it doesn't have as strong a place in my memory uh but yeah, I really liked it. I think, you know, there's great performances from Colin Farrell and Jody, Joni Turner-Smith and uh, Hayley Lou Richardson, who had previously been in Kogan- Koganada's previous film. Um, yeah, lots of interesting little things that are like peppered through, like interesting ideas and that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, I think that's worth checking out. But again, that's probably going to be difficult for you to see because <laughs> it was playing in like two cinemas here in Brisbane, so... I can watch Coming everything. The, uh, I can watch everything. Uh, eventually, uh, whatever. What's that movie called? Everything. Every, everywhere. Everything everywhere all at once. Everything like, everywhere all at once is uh, VOD in a couple weeks. So, yeah. Thank good. fuck Got I don't st- have to wait like months, and I just have to wait a few more weeks at least. A few more weeks. All right. Speaking of th- things that you did watch recently that you had been waiting on, let's see if this works better than last <laughs> last episode. Uh, you checked out, you finally got the chance to watch X. I thought he was going to say something else, but yeah, okay. Um, let's, let's start with this. Okay. One. <laughs> I was like, yeah, cause it's another episode of Dylan watches stuff that everyone else watched ages ago. Um, X fucking loved it. How good. Um, so this is the fuck. What's his name? Ty West. Yes, Ty West. I don't need to look it up. I don't remember that. This is the latest movie from Ty West. Um, it is about this group of people who work at... Oh, I don't actually know if they all work there, but they, at least a few of them work uh, at a um, strip club, I guess. Um, and I think it's like early, late 60s, early 70s. No, they have to be like early 70s, I guess, yeah. 
uh, early 70s who they set out um, with the full intent of making a porn film. Um, there's a lot of discussion in the, in the, in the movie about – you know, like this is the future, like people watching porn on home video and like, you know, all this sort of, which is quite funny to, um, to hear, <laughs> uh, the guy who they've, one of the, I guess friends or something, I don't know. Um, they've got this like sort of younger kid to be the filmmaker and he's like t- the director and he's like talking about, you know, I don't want to make porn. That's just like people fucking like, I want to make it like cinematic. And he's like talking about all these directorial things, which is quite entertaining. <laughs> but, um, so they set out to this, uh, how many is there? One, two, three, I think it was like five, I guess, six, maybe. Um, the, they set out to this farmhouse, uh, where the main character, oh, fucking hold on for his name, cause he's so good. I actually hadn't seen him much before. Um, this guy, yeah, Wayne, right? Who's the, the one who's setting it all up, um, played by Martin A. Henderson. Uh, and he's like, s- sort of sets out. So it's him. Uh, you've got this other guy, Jackson. Who's going to be like the star of the movie? I guess the guy is played by Kid Cudi. Um, then you've got Brittany Snow um, playing Bobby Lynn. Most people would know her from uh, the Pitch Perfect films. Uh, Jen- Jenna Ortega is in it as Lorraine. She's like the partner of Owen Campbell's character RJ, who's the director kid I was talking about before. And then um, the star is Mia Goth, who's playing. Um, Maxine, who's like one of the co-lead girls that's going to be in this film. Uh, they set out and they're going to, they're, they've organized to pay this older dude uh, to stay at his farm. Uh, he's got like a spare like house or whatever out in the backyard, like sort of separate and then paid to like rent it out or whatever. Of course, they don't tell them that the reason they want to rent the, this out is to film a porn movie there. They just say that they, you know, just want to stay there or whatever. And he's very weird when they get there. Um, Jenna, no, not Jenna, the Mia Goss character like spots a, um, this older lady like spying on him from the window looking very creepy and weird. Um, of course you can probably guess by now shit starts to go weird and creepy by the time night, nighttime hits. Old, old ladies like creeping around butt naked for spying on him doing God knows what. Um, she spots them filming one of the porn scenes and then sort of shit goes weird from there because she's, Let's I know. Let's, the easiest way to put it is she's not a fan of what she sees. Let's let's say it that way. But there's more to it mm. than that. Um, it's really entertaining. It's like a B. Of course, it's like got this B grade film done on purpose. Um, the editing I really really enjoyed. I think it's like it'll constantly sort of do this weird intercuts to other stuff. Um, that sort of gives it this whole sort of grindhouse sort of film uh, aesthetic. The cast is all fantastic. Like they're all very lively, full of personality. This is a horror movie where you actually don't like dislike any of the characters. Like they're all pretty fun and, and great to hang around. Um, everyone's really great. It's shot really well. It's not shot like a B grade movie, although it has that style. Like it, it does have a lot of really good cinematography and, and stuff like that. Music's really great. Um, and yeah, the, I mean, if you watch the trailer, like the trailer is fantastic. Did you ever watch the trailer for this? Like this, did we talk about that? Not here. I can't even I don't remember. don't think so. Yeah. If you, sh- you should watch the trailer because tra- <laughs> the trailer is just like, it's cut and edited so well. Like it's got this, like the music that kicks in is like, Dun-dun. and then by the time you get to the end, it has, um, cause the movie starts with these cops showing up at the house, like, like 24 hours and it goes back 24 hours. And there's, you know, just like bloodbath everywhere and stuff. And these, these sheriffs like trying to work out what happens. And then, uh, one of them like pulls out the, they show this in the trailer where one of these detectives runs up or whatever and finds this camera and like asks the detective, like, what do you think's on this? And they, they use this, great line in the trailer where he's like some fucked up horror picture like <laughs> it's like such it's just like and the way they add it into the trailer at the end is fucking fantastic but um i love this and there's a prequel coming out which i'm very keen for and i just love the whole background story to this which is that um they went and stayed at um they filmed this in new zealand because i guess uh, a lot of movies were filmed in new zealand and australia last year where people could sort of do stuff, I guess, but um, yep. had to do the two week mandatory lockdown to film everything. So the cast and crew and everyone um, much like in the movie, the bubble, which I don't suggest you watching cause it's horrible. Um, although I want to watch <laughs> that anime one bubble. I don't know what the difference is there, but so I can watch that. Anyway, that's finally out. So I know well, one's an anime and one's not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the while, while in lockdown, Ty West wrote a script for a prequel um, to this, which is about the, um, the the two older i guess the the older characters i guess and like what leads them to become the people they are in this film and the background to that um and then because everyone was already there was like hey do you want to like shoot this and then everyone apparently was like yeah fuck it let's go and they've they've already got like the house um and but the trailer originally 
played for that at the end of this in the cinema. It's not at the end of it on VOD or rental or buy or however you do it, which is sort of annoying. I did manage to find it online, even though they keep trying to pull it down. I guess that they don't want the trailer out because it's not an official trailer. It was like an after credits trailer thing, mm. um, which is annoying. But um, I love how they're using the same place in the, in, uh, you can see. However, this movie primarily takes place at night and in the trailer for the C- the prequel, which is just called Pearl, it's uh, like shot very like lively, a lot more color and everything like that. It's like, I can sort of appreciate the fact that they've made the, just the, the use of that time and like wh- who's there and what they can use. Like I sort of love that from a filmmaking standpoint. And then you can see some of the people in the trailer um, who are actors in this movie playing different characters. So it's just like, it's one of those things. It's like, Oh, fuck it. Let's just, um, so I really quite enjoy that um, idea. Um, but yeah, X is fantastic. If you're a horror movie fan, I highly suggest it. All right. Well, let's talk about the other film that you finally got to watch. Uh, the Academy Award nominated Licorice Pizza. Good, not great. Like, um, I feel... Like it, I don't want to spend too much on this because it's, it's like I've watched it 10 years after it fucking come out at this point. Yeah. I, well, I'm going to be talking about some movies we watched 10 years after they come out, so don't worry. That's true. Uh, but it feels different when they're actually older and not just like... You know, you're six months late to the party rather than like... It's two <laughs> years later and at least it's like, oh, I remember that film? Um I feel like, um, so Cooper Hoffman's really great. Um, what the fuck's the girl's name? Lana Hamer. Lana Hamer, yeah. She's really great. I feel like there's just some, like, so the whole thing when you get into this movie and you're like, and of course a lot of discussions around, because the plot is about a 15, he's 15, right? I think. Yeah. 15, 16, whatever. It so it's a plot about a 15-year-old guy who at the very start of the movie tries to hit on this girl who's like 20 21 whatever she is i don't actually know anyway she's in her 20s uh, and then the movie becomes about their uh relationship and therefore now this is already i know like a big discussion point in like how it goes like what's weird i think the movie sort of does everything almost right because any scene where like it's weird between them or try like it's just always him hitting on her she never hits on reciprocates however without getting the spoilers i will say i did not like the ending at all yeah i feel like the ending completely falls apart to the point that i'm like you sort of just like screwed over everything that you've done throughout this entire film like i i have no idea what the the point of the ending is i don't know why those characters these two characters do the way they do i don't know if it was supposed to be a it's supposed to be this like happy like woo like everything's fine like ending for them but i'm like i don't know like this wasn't the ending i felt like this movie was building up to i don't feel like this is the mature take on the ending this movie should have i don't really feel like i i yeah so that was my thing like i i enjoyed the movie i think it has some fantastic scenes bradley cooper for the short time he in it he's in it is fucking off his face and that's very enjoyable to watch um <laughs> um lots of like other little one small of the best cameos chase sick- one of the best vehicle sequences <laughs> yeah. involving a car with the engine off. Yes, yes. Um, all of that's fantastic. Everyone's good. I would say that, yeah, my, my, I would, I think it's a movie in which the ending just didn't work for me and it sort of just let everything that sort of come down. No, it doesn't ruin it, but I feel like this movie was relying on it, its ending to sort of tie the package all together. And there's a bunch of great scenes beforehand, but yeah, I was like, by the end, I was like, I don't know. Like, I don't, I don't get the, and, if I want to compare this to another movie I said that was like, it was good, not great. Um, similarly was, which was, um, Red Rocket, right? So Red Rocket yeah. is a film in which again, I, and without spoilers, cause I'm always dodging fucking spoilers lately, but Red Rocket is a film about this guy who is cheating on this underage girl and, <laughs> and I, uh, to get her to become a porn star or whatever. However, that movie I don't feel like you ever like he's an enjoyable character to watch to the point, but you always know he's a slime ball, right? He's the bad guy, and you're literally watching someone um, groom a young girl. That's the thing. So, like, and I feel like that movie knows he's the bad guy, and he's the the bad person. So, I feel like for any of the, whenever we get into these discussions about uh, having movies where adults are getting with like underage uh, girls, guys, whatever it is. And it was always like, well, what's the intent? What's the direction and stuff like that? Like as much as I was like, sort of felt like I've got some problems with that movie, Red Rocket. I feel like that movie knows. And like, at least it came across to me, like the point was to show this guy who is grooming this underage girl. 
And I don't love that movie's ending, but I would say I like it more than this one. So if you've seen both movies, <laughs> in a world where you've seen both movies, and you know how both movies end, mm-hmm. I would say Red Rocket's ending, um, I have some opinions on on, on that ending. I, I, I would like it a lot more than this one, because this movie is just like... Ta-da! I was like, oh, no, no, it's fucking sort of a letdown, to be honest. But yeah, it's good. Nowhere near as good as uh, I, I feel like, like, it definitely wouldn't, it, I don't think it would have budged into my top 10. That's for sure. After now watching it, I, I feel like if I was looking back at my top 10, uh, for one of these best picture nominated movies, it's it's not making it in my top 10. Now that you watch it, you're like, <laughs> I don't feel so bad about what, having to see it six months I later. still wish I could have seen it. Like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just so I can watch it when everyone else is and not six months later. But yeah, okay. But yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it wouldn't have made my top 10. Yeah. I, I think, you know, it's an interesting movie that's uh, raised some interesting discussion. Yeah. And then, um, getting into the, the racism, the, <laughs> that stuff. Uh, I, my hot take on that, I don't, well, I don't even think it's hot take. My opinion on that is I didn't laugh and I feel like you're supposed to f- feel like he's a, He's yeah, a, if you're laughing, you're doubling on yourself. Yes, yeah. I, 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 um, this is the thing where you get into weird, and I understand how like different points of the arguments, but I feel like it's Paul W. S. Anderson just trying to show us a, a type of person that existed during that Paul time. Paul Thomas Anderson. Sorry, Paul Thomas Anderson. Yes, I think this movie would be yeah. way different if yeah. Paul W. S. Yeah, Anderson. Yeah, I know. Wouldn't it be weirder? Um, it is... Mila Djokovic would have played. <laughs> I know, right? It would have been way more action-heavy. Um, it, um, it's just like a, a... Yeah. Does that need to be in the movie? I would say no. Do I think he's doing it to purposely be racist? No. But do I think it needs okay. to be in the movie? No. I, I feel like I'm just no on, on both. I don't feel like he's he's doing it. To, he's not doing the stereotype to get a joke out of it being a stereotype. Like I don't feel like Anderson is doing it because he thinks it's funny. I feel like I know why he's doing it, but I'll still say there's no reason it really needs to be in a movie because it's literally two scenes. Yep. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's my thoughts okay. on that. The other discussion point. All right. Uh, so I watched the first episode of The Offer. So this is the TV show about how they made The Godfather. Uh, so Miles Teller plays uh, Al Ruddy, who was the producer on The on the godfather uh you know uh, and kind of here's the focal point i want to say uh of of the mini series um yeah pretty much coming from he starts off as like a programmer at a company uh meets a bunch of he lives next to a comedy writer so he ends up meeting a bunch of comedy writers teams up with another one pitches Hogan's Heroes. Hogan's Heroes gets picked up, and then he decides, "Hey, I want to get into movies because you know I always love movies." Um, yeah, and then eventually, you know, as this is going on, uh, Mario Puzo is writing novels. He uh, f- gets around. He writes The Godfather. It becomes a huge hit. So in lots of books, uh, Paramount had optioned the book uh, very very early. Uh, and you know they just they put Al Ruddy on to produce The Godfather, uh, and kind of follows the all that happening. Also juxtaposed with this is uh, the actual mafia community, <laughs> uh, headlined by Giovanni, Giovanni Ribisi, plays one of the mobsters. Um, they're not fans of The Godfather, so their thing is they don't want this movie to get made. <laughs> Because they think the book is making fun of them and that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the setup for this. This move, this first episode, like moves very quickly. Like they don't have a clear distinguishing time difference. You know, it just jumps forward years. Uh, potentially, like uh, Puzo's like, "Hey, I need." It takes me like six years to write a novel, uh, but then like one minute he's coming up with the idea, the next minute the book's out for a year and that kind of stuff. So, uh, I feel like that's a bit of an issue, but I'm enjoying like the, not knowing the massive backstory of how this movie got made and that kind of stuff. Um, I think it's interesting. Uh, they've got, (laughs) uh, but yeah, it moves along at like a fast, at least in this first episode at a very fast clip. Here's my, so I want to watch this now. 
Yes. The one thing that I was like, mm, the one part this could fall apart in my mind. The casting of Francis Ford Coppola. I would, Where they've got Dan Fogler. Yep, Dan Fogler, I could not. That was the one. I was like, mm. so how's that? It's okay. I mean, <laughs> um, I haven't seen many interviews with like Francis Ford Coppola, so I can't really compare. He's a very but, serious uh, speaking person, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, obviously... Yeah, it, it. He's certainly doing a take. Okay, I would say. Okay. Um, so it, I I would recommend watching the first episode because obviously, he shows up in the episode. He shows up at the end. Okay. Uh, starting the coming in as the director of the Godfather. Um, but yeah, I'm it, I'm keen to like keep watching. I do enjoy shows set around Hollywood. Uh, and that kind of stuff. It de- you definitely got the vibes of, uh, of early Hollywood. There's like totally random stuff. Like Al, Al Ruddy's first film was, uh, starred Robert Redford. So he has to convince Robert Redford to be in his film because apparently at the time he was being, he's working for Paramount, but apparently at the time Robert Redford was getting sued by Paramount. So he wasn't keen to jump on to the project Al Ruddy was trying to make, uh, and that kind of stuff. So. Yeah, lots of interesting like little things here and there. Little weird cameos and that kind of stuff from different famous people and that kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah, this is on Paramount Plus, I believe. But I read somewhere that the first episode is free. You can just watch it uh, somewhere. But, uh, yeah, I think on Paramount three Plus episodes or... up. On Paramount Plus, I think. Okay. I was about to say, that's not a bad idea if they want to get more subscribers, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the I think there's three episodes out now, and they'll probably release... It's weekly now, weekly, I think. Weekly, yeah. I would assume, after that. Uh, yeah. So there's ten episodes in the miniseries, so yeah. Definitely keen on watching more of that. Uh, Alright. So I... <laughs> uh, So I finally got... I watched The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent, like, a couple of days after the... Well, the day the last episode came out. Mm-hmm. Obviously, this is the Nick Cage movie in which he plays Nick Cage, uh, who's you know struggling financially, struggling to get roles. Uh, agrees to go to a uh, million dollars to show up at a party for a rich uh, Italian businessman, yeah. <laughs> played by Pedro Pascal, who's a super fan. They become best buds, uh, but it turns out that Pedro Pascal's character might be a terrible uh, warlord who has uh, kidnapped a. President's daughter. Uh, the daughter of a president's daughter. Plot of resident, uh, You know, so Nick Cage is recruited by the CAA to spy on Pedro Pascal. You know, and shit happens. Super enjoyable. Like, a lot of fun. Uh, Pedro Pascal's really great. Nick Cage is really great. We've all seen the Paddington thing now. It's great. <laughs> How good. Uh, I, I hope I didn't set it up too mad. Like, I was like, you know. Setting up going yeah. in, but I mean, it's the punchline to the joke. It's so good, and, you know, they, <laughs> they utilize it very well. Um, yeah, it is someone who had not seen many, you know, Nick Cage. Nick Cage films. It's like you could follow along, it did really matter. I don't think there was much. I don't feel like you need like, to have watched Nick Cage movies to find this funny, but it, you'll f- get a little bit more out of it. Is how I would. I think, you know, when they go into that cave, is is a uh, family of memorabilia. Room. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the fanboy room. There's stuff I think to that's spot. the only one. You can spot some stuff in the background. Yes. But last episode, we did top three Nick Cage movies you should watch mm. uh, to prepare for this movie. After watching it, all mine completely wrong. You should just completely <laughs> forget about what I said. Actually, I think that there might have been one or two National Treasure Jokes, but other than that, uh, yeah, completely disregard my list. But Dylan had a very good list. Uh, that. I watched all three films the day before I went, so... Did your homework? I I did my homework. I watched Raising Arizona, obviously, the film... The Coen Brothers film, mm-hmm. starring Nicolas Cage, uh... Holy Hunter, Hunter I want to say? Yeah, Holy Hunter. Hunter, in which, you know, he plays a criminal, career criminal, uh, who, you know... Steals a baby. Falls in love with Holly Hunter's, <laughs> Hunter's police officer. And, you know, they're unable to have children of their own. So they steal a baby from a furniture salesman who had quintuplets. Yep. 
yeah, that need as it. you do. Because she, they didn't need one. Like they had enough. No, they they had enough. <laughs> they had more than they could handle. So I mean, they were really doing the right thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it. You know, super. It is very uh, narration heavy, more than like any other film nowadays would get away with. Mm. Like he talked. Nick Cage is talking a lot. But it's good in this movie. But it's good. It's it's, it's crazy. It's definitely a Coen Brothers movie of that ilk uh, of their comedy types, uh, in which you know totally random shit happens, like a bounty hunter mm. on a motorbike. Uh, well, that's not that scene at the end though. The ba- like where they're on the highway and the baby and <laughs> I think about it. Often. I I really like this movie. I don't know. I I even before this, I would quite often like it. You know. Like sort of lost films or films that people don't think about often. I'm always like raising Arizona. Like, it's fucking. I think it's very, very funny. Uh, yeah. So I really enjoyed that one. Then I watched Face Off, mm. John Woo film starring John Travolta, Nick Cage, which Nick Cage plays a crazy terrorist, uh, over the eccentric terrorist. John Travolta plays the head of the some secret police organization yeah. just it's not really clear uh he captures nick cage but nick cage uh is in a coma but has set off a bomb somewhere in the city and the only way that he'll be able to convince nick cage's brother that where the bomb is and be able to tell everybody is if he takes nick's cage's face puts it on his own face uh you know as a, a <laughs> this special futuristic surgery so you know he becomes nick cage he looks like nick cage goes into prison to get this information but oh no nick cage woke up and now he's uh forced the doctors to put john travolta's face on his face and then you know (laughs) (laughs) he goes to the prison to see john travolta in nick cage's face they have a face off Mm. and yeah i (laughs) This uh, this was this this was all right. This, it went a bit of, on a bit too long, especially the, the the climactic chase sequence seemed to go on forever. Uh, yeah, it just feels a little bit bloated. I think is what my criticism would be. Um, great performances, but pretty good performances by John Travolta and Nick Cage, like matching up to what you saw earlier in the film and that kind of stuff. It's kind of interesting. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's some solid action and that kind of stuff, but yeah, it, it, it just goes on and 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 on. And then some doves show up and then it keeps going. Um, important yeah. movie for the unbearable way to mess and tell though. Yeah. I mean, the, I mean, yeah. <laughs> then I watched Con Air. Mm. Very important. So I'd never seen Con Air. Very before. important movie to watch before watching yeah, because you know it shows shows up. I thought I'd saw, seen Con Air because I'd seen the music video uh, of How Do I Live several times. So you just thought you watched the movie because of that? Yeah, <laughs> it's like why do I need to see the movie? I've seen the music video. No, you need to see the movie. Entire thing. Uh, Con Air is fucking fantastic. Welcome <laughs> to the. Room I don't, I don't, why lovely. did anybody <laughs> tell me before that Con Air is a movie that everybody should watch? It's like not watching Die Hard. I feel like not watching Con Air. Like yeah. <laughs> So yes, uh, Nicholas Cage plays a U.S. Marine who's just come home from service. Uh, who, after spending his first night with his girlfriend, partner, yeah, their wife, partner. I don't remember if they're married, but yeah, it's been a while since I married. Uh, finds out she's pregnant with his baby. Uh, he gets into a scuffle with people who a bunch of sexist. I don't know. Yeah, the ruffians yeah. or whatever accidentally kills one of them who had a knife on him but you know the the, the knife went missing had it coming uh apparently he goes to jail because he's a weapon of yeah. he's trained his body to become a living weapon yeah, that was a court case uh, that so- you know like the reason the only person this other person dies because he's a living weapon like from the army and yeah. Shit, yeah so he spent several years in jail he finally gets to go home to his meet his daughter for the first time he's being transferred on this big prison shit airplane where they're transferring all these convicts to uh new max ex- maximum security prison uh and then the 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 the, the plane's taken over by the con the the, the conman 
It's Con Air. It's Con Air. You know, and then they've got to try and stop the plane. Nick Cage is trying to be the good guy and save people. John Cusack's on the ground is like not being treated, not being treated fairly by the other, <laughs> the older agents who think they know better and shit. Uh, yeah, fantastic, really enjoyable. Uh, <laughs> I would, you know, happily watch uh, Nick Cage talk with that Alabanian <laughs> accent for ages. <laughs> That's, that might be the best part. Got your present, honey. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I'm really glad that I watched Con Air. Uh, that had a really long ending as well, but I mean, that was just enjoyable, like seeing Nick Cage versus John Malkovich. Uh, <laughs> lots of interesting cameos and characters I didn't realize were in this movie, like Danny Trejo and uh, Steve Buscemi. other people like that. Yeah. 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 So, Con Air, check it out if you haven't watched it before. I know nobody ever talks about <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, small indie film, Con, Con Air. Is, yeah, no one's watched yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, small film, yeah. Con Air. You should definitely check it out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Dylan, you finished watching Tom and P- there. Pam and Tommy. I did. Talking about things that go a bit too long. Um, I finished it up. I I like the direction they ended up taking the series, but I just feel like it was, yeah, just a bit, like it could have definitely been a lot shorter. So, like... They, they take the right direction, which is the the true, like, sort of narrative of the story, which is that, you know, um, the the fact that this guy, and they make sure to cover this. I, I can't bother looking up the actual dude's name, but the, the person that um, Seth Rogen plays, the guy who breaks in, because I sort of talked about the first few episodes here, didn't I, whenever it started. Yep. Um, he breaks in, he steals the, the safe, which has the sex tape on it, and then he... Um, begins distributing this and all that. And by the end of the series, you've got this thing happening where he actually gets told by a uh, female friend, like, and she goes off at him because she's like, how dare you do that? Like, that's like totally, he's like, Seth Rogen's being like, it's just porn though. And she's like, no, it's not. It's like their personal life. And you know, like she's like saying like watching it, it's actually rather romantic and, you know, like, how dare you do that to them and all this sort of stuff. And then you have these other scenes between Pam and Tommy where Tommy, you know, like, he'll be out at a bar and guys are just like, fuck yeah, dude, fucking great that you've got a big dick and you get to put fuck Pam. And then, you know, like, people are watching it, like, Pam's just, you know, like, she gets to be called a slut and, like, you know, like, it's just, like, it takes that sort of, like, I, I mm. appreciated the direction it sort of took with the, the, the story and the people I would say it sort of downplays how much of a um that it shows Tommy being an asshole I think it downplays how big of an asshole Tommy was still though I definitely feel like I feel like for the sake of making the show more watchable uh and maybe it's just because Sebastian Stan was also so good at playing this this version of Tommy Lee maybe they downplayed it but I mean by the time you get to the end of the show, it, instead of there's like one scene in maybe the final second last episode where you see him like push her or something like that, and then you get to like the you know the typical true story thing where it's like credits, then comes up with you know all the post text saying you know this this this. It's like oh, Pam and Tommy split up after police were called and he was like hitting her and you know like but it's well known that was happening prior to that like and he was abusive to her, but they never really cover that in this. For, and I think solely for the the reason of making it less dark, I guess, and more like, oh, it's comedy, a bit lighthearted sort of thing. So, um, but yeah, it definitely drags on a bit too long. Um, but I still, yeah, it's I'd say it's okay. Like, it's, an, it's enjoyable for what it is, but it's definitely not what it could have been. All right. Uh, so I finished this season of Abbott's Elementary, which released on Disney+. Plus. Uh, this is the TV show in which uh, Queen of Brunson... Uh, the creator of the show plays a second grade teacher at Abbott's Elementary in Philadelphia. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I think this is a great show. Uh, like really wholesome, fun content. I know you said you just finished watching Superstore. Uh, I think this might be the next thing that like I could fit fill that void. I feel like it's very good. Similar dynamics to that kind of a show. Um, only thirteen episodes in the first season. Um, really enjoyed how the, the the cast grew over the season. Um, and yeah, I, I'm keen for them to come back. Um, 
yeah, I just wanted to shout that out, show it out, and you know, I feel like it just needs a little bit. I people in here in Australia, I don't feel like talk about it at all. So, uh, you know, check it, check out Abbas Elementary on Disney Plus. It's a great sitcom. Uh, I watched two sports documentary series. Uh, they call me Magic, uh, released on Apple Plus. It is a documentary series about Irvin Magic Johnson, who everybody would know as a big a championship Laker player, uh, pretty much just chronicling his career. Obviously, um, playing for big coming in, playing for the Lakers as the number one draft pick, helping lead them to the champion many championships, having a very good career, uh, and then kind of the big turning point in his career was uh, he contracted HIV. And like, um, kind of how that affected his life and like, uh, how he's kind of still here, even though he had HIV at a time in which people, it was pretty much a death sentence and that kind of stuff. Um, it, 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 I think it's a pretty interesting documentary and it's probably good timing as well. That's currently going on while they've got the Lakers TV show at the moment, uh, winning time. Uh, it's got nice contrast of like, this is what happened in the future. I mean, it's spoiling it a little bit. Uh, if you if you didn't who, know what happened with the Lakers and that kind of stuff, who produced this? I don't know. Like I was just gonna say, like how do they time these things up so well? Sometimes you know what I mean. <laughs> it's, just, it's like they're made in tandem. Uh, yeah, but maybe I mean they're not because I, I don't mean, think it's the same. It's not the no, same. it's it's obviously that's a HBO thing. Yeah. So this is so, it's definitely not a thing together. Yeah, it's just. It's interesting sometimes. This is, I feel like this was something that was put together on the back of the success of The Last Dance and, like, yeah, yeah. some popularity of that kind of stuff. Uh, but, yeah, obviously him touching on, like, he he was not a very... Uh, he slept around a lot and did a lot of partying and that kind of stuff. And, like, it doesn't shy away from some of the darker elements of his story. Uh, and also talks about some of his post, uh, post-basketball post career. Like, he got into theatre, like, building theaters like movie a movie theater chain uh and that kind of stuff so yeah i th- I think you know an interesting documentary if you're if you have any interest in basketball and that kind of stuff and i also watched the uh <laughs> football documentary that's on disney plus at the moment the man in the reader which is focused on tom brady and his uh currently nine uh super bowl appearances for the patriots uh Again, it's it's a very much a reflective kind of story, uh, you know. Just uh, as someone who knows very little about Tom Brady and his, uh, no, I know Ash. He's the goat. He's the goat. He's the goat. He's the goat. He's won several. He's won several (laughs) championships. He's won several Super Bowls. Uh, Yeah, I mean, it's interesting and like kind of fills in the gaps on this massive sporting figure who I know very little about and like kind of paints a picture of his career and that kind of stuff and the struggles he's had uh injury wise and then the pressure he had being a such a successful player and then like him him also like being into alternative medicines and that kind of stuff uh yeah i think it's quite interesting apparently there's meant to be a 10th episode because obviously he won another super bowl with the tampa bay buccaneers uh but whereas this whole documentary focuses on his time with the patriots uh but apparently it's been delayed like several times like i don't know but yeah, I, th- I thought it was a good watch. You know, it, it, an easy watch. So that's on Disney Plus. But let's jump into the mandatory Netflix segment of the show. Uh, last episode, we talked about the Heartstoppers trailer, and the Heartstoppers TV show finally came out on Disney on <laughs> Netflix. Uh, so it follows young Charlie, a high school student uh, in Britain, uh, who's gay uh and he falls in love with his new form room uh person who sits in the chair next to him nick nelson uh and kind of like chronicles their friendship that maybe blooms into something more uh it does uh <laughs> yeah this is you know a very fun like coming of age romance show uh set in a high school with a nice diverse cast uh i don't know i i, I didn't i liked it i didn't love it i i yeah just something didn't get me over the line um 
I think, you know, there, there's a lot of great characters, a lot of interesting, like, yeah, I don't know. There's just something that didn't click for me. But Dylan, it sounds like you love the show. I love the show. Um, I don't know what. Yeah, I don't know what exactly the I'd pinpoint as the difference between me liking it and you loving it and you just thinking it's good. But yeah, obviously it did click for me. But I think it's yeah, so I binged it all, I just watched it all in like one evening. They're like twenty minute episodes anyway, so Yeah, it's very short. It's not thirty minute, eight episodes. Yeah. yeah. You, can, you can smash for it pretty quickly. Um the funniest thing is that remember last time I was like, I've read some of this. I've always wanted to like because they were web, web comics. I've always wanted to buy yep. the collected novels or whatever, collected editions. And now after watching this, I'm like, fuck. All right. I was looking at Amazon cart the other night. Um, the, <laughs> um, I just think it's just very wholesome. It's very wholesome. Yep. Very entertaining. It, it's, it's, I don't know. Like, it's just the setting. I liked all the characters. I think the romance is just very believable. I think that Nick. I appreciate they didn't drag it out. Yeah. I feel like Nick and Charlie just both feel like real teenagers with their own, you know, pluses and minuses, very likable people. Um, Charlie getting like, like constantly told by his friends, like, and all this stuff, uh, like, you know, tracing after the straight guy. And he's like, look, I'm happy to be friends and, you know, this sort of stuff. And then it's like very obvious as to you as a viewer because you get to see stuff that Charlie doesn't that obviously Nick. I think that's the other thing. Like, it's not like, it's not played weird because you constantly know that he's like sort of questioning his sexuality. Like, even if Charlie doesn't know that the entire time, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, yep. like you, you as a viewer know that you can see that he's sort of question, like starting to question his sexuality or maybe questioning his sexuality. Um, but I, yeah, I would definitely say the star of the show was Nick. Um, I think, and I tweeted about it. I think that show, that scene with him and Olivia Coleman, um, who, again, who is in yeah. the show, like <laughs> yeah. what? Um, just as a mum, just as uh, Nick's uh, Nick's mum, which Nick's is, mom. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, Academy Award uh, Emmy nominated. Apparently, yeah. Olivia Coleman filled all her scenes in two days. Yep, love her, love her. She comes back. She supports the, you know. Supports. supports the British TV yeah, scene. Yeah, supports the British TV scene. But yeah, that scene between her and Nick, without spoilers, that scene between her and Nick uh, at the in the last episode, I thought was fantastic. Well acted by both of them. Um, the sort of scene that you don't really see, um, I guess, have it seen represented in um, TV shows or movies. But I thought that was fantastic. And yeah, Olivia Coleman adds a lot to that, just as the, the mum in that scene. Such a, a lovable, fantastic mum in that scene. Made me tear up for sure. Um, the, maybe that's also a difference. Like, maybe I'm just like, it hit something for me. The, I think it shot really well. Lots of great music. I think it's a bunch of the side characters are really great. And I hope that now that if the show is a great success, I would love to see, um, some of the side characters get their stories explored a lot more. In the- I think that maybe that's what it was. Like, the, I feel like the side <laughs> characters didn't get their yeah. due. They get enough. That, maybe that's why. I, I don't blame it. It's eight episodes, 20 minutes, Right. You get uh, this great romance story between the two characters in this one. And now, if it's good enough and we get second and third season or whatever, now I need you to build upon the stepping stones of the side characters um, in that. In that, I understand why, you, with the, what time given, it, it is used to tell a, a very focused story on the, on the. Yeah. I think it's the the pacing of the show and, like, it obviously being these 20 minute episodes and that kind of stuff. Yeah. And then me internally, whether I realize it or not by comparing it to something like sex education which is Freeze. a very similar setting a lot more seasons similar yeah yeah but they like bet you the if you episodes go back, were like i bet you if you long. go back and watch the first season even then you'd be like i think i pretty much i probably did say yeah. it just took me a little while to click into it but yeah um yeah i liked it uh i you know i really hope tau and uh l l get together you know yeah because they 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 they're they're yeah, things, the will they won't they? Yeah, will they won't they? And th- and that's great, and that definitely needs to be built, built upon. But then you have the I'd have to actually look what his name is. Um, uh, Isaac, the other friend, right? He's definitely like he's, <laughs> he's there. <laughs> you he's know, there. he's there. Like, he's fun. Like you're like this guy seems fun. Like he's always reading, and he's just he's like, like yeah. <laughs> but he doesn't get any scenes. No, but yeah. So I'm like give that like, give that character something in the next season. My God, <laughs> yeah. Or like explain all the books. He's just a he's just a reader, you know. My also my favorite um 
<laughs> my favorite scenes is when L um that comes over to watch that movie and then like discussing watching what they should watch. And then I think she's like, why don't we watch like Captain America Iron Man or something? He's like, I wanted to watch cinema. <laughs> like, <laughs> he's like He's like suggesting like fucking A24 <laughs> films or whatever. I was like, I appreciate this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like he comes over. He's gonna come over and make us watch the Avengers. Yeah, yeah. Ugh. Yeah, I thought it was funny. But no, yeah, I, I, I love this. This is definitely one of my favorite things to be the shows I watched this year. I thought it was fantastic. All right. Yeah. All right. Uh, you also watched Season 2 of Russian Doll. Yep. Very good. Have I'll talk about it? it. Yeah, I finished it. I uh, finished it this morning or last night, whenever it was. Um, okay. It's six or seven episodes. I think it's like one episode, two episodes shorter than the last. Again, they're only like 20 minute, half hour episode so you can you can get through it pretty quickly um the i'm trying to think what's in the trailer and what's not like a spoiler so the setup for this season is that uh fuck what's her name i can't remember her name anyway whatever the main character who obviously in the natasha leone yeah natasha yeah. leone <laughs> she um goes into this in the first season obviously she has the thing where she keeps dying and it's groundhog day and she comes back this season they're they everything's fresh it's new it's exciting it's it's not trying to retread do the same jokes so this is like sometime later after the first season um she gets on a train uh to go home um anyway she walks out it's like 1970 so that's a that's a thing i i don't i don't think i can spoil too much more than that because i don't uh, because there's definitely some quick reveals but none of it's shown in the trailer at least from what i can remember so and given you know it just came out I don't want to spoil it all, but there are some quick reveals as to what's how people view her, I guess. Like maybe it's not a spoiler to say she is not herself when she travels in the time, I guess, if that makes sense. So she is walking around as a different character when she goes back in time. So you as a viewer, sometimes you'll see Natasha Leone, and then once they reveal she's like walking around as someone else, they'll show you like a different actress, if that makes sense. So the the people in the world are, think she's someone else, but she's not. Um, the uh, bunch of other people in this are fantastic. Uh, Shatlow Copley, Shat Shatlow Copley, who most people I guess uh, you know most from District Nine, um, is really good in this. A lot of fun. Uh, there's also what's her face from. Um, uh, Shit's Creek, the sister. I can't remember the actress's name. She's very good in this as well. Um, Annie Murphy. She, yeah, she's very good in this. Not playing anything like the same character, but she's also, she's very, very good in this. I quite enjoyed her in this. Um, but yeah, the, the jokes are so funny. I mean, just watching the first episode with Natasha Leone and just having that character, even though I only just watched the first season, but like, uh, like the time difference and knowing it's like been years and she just feels like she slips straight back into this character. And it's such an enjoyable character. Like she's trying to quit smoking at the start of this season and like she's in a bar or a restaurant at the start before everything starts to go wrong. And um, she like chucks a cigarette in her mouth and someone's about to tell her off of smoking. And she's like, no, I just need to, like, <laughs> I just need to chill. And then she's like, goes to like, she's like standing there waiting for the train of the cigarette hanging out. And just like the way she like subtly like pulls out a lighter and, brings it so up and then like pulls it away like she's fighting with herself there's like so much like weird like uh just simple jokes i guess happening at, at all times but like much like the first season everything builds towards a uh, dramatic finale that's actually built on um drama not jokes much like the first season reveals that to do with characters and and stuff like that and i um i thought it was great i thought it was i again it's like do we need a third season no did you need a second after the first one no but um but i would say if this is it Great. Two fantastic seasons. Definitely really enjoyed it. All right. Well, that's everything I watched history. Let's move into some film news and Dylan CinemaCon happened Yay. last week. Uh, movies are back. Uh, I think, you know, uh, lots of things to be excited about. Lots of people, a lot of all the cinema, go all the cinema owners super happy about how the pandemic seems to be over. Things are getting back to normal. Uh, I think one of the, Apparently, like, one of the, like, lead people was like, yes, cinema's are back. Piracy is done by all these people who are doing, like, drug deals and <laughs> bullshit like that. It's, like, really weird. <laughs> uh, do, so, what do you think was the biggest news at a CinemaCon? Um, in your opinion. Fuck. My opi uh, Avatar, I guess, is what I've seen posted the most around. Avatar, probably. Yeah, so we got our first look. Well, they got their first look I was so gonna say, if but you all these know. new stories it's like people have seen stuff people have seen stuff people have seen stuff i mean images from avatar have That's been leaked yeah, and the trailer so we should be talking about trailer uh, hopefully talk about next episode yeah, it should be out it is releasing in front of dr strange the multiverse madness uh but yeah for the people who don't know cinemacon 
a big uh, expo for the theatre owners. They go there, the studios come out and tell you the different things they're going to be releasing in the year. It's the movie equivalent of what E3 once was. Yeah, so it's theatre um, owners and press. and So you're trying to sell yeah. to people and you're trying to have press write about your product. Yeah, it's what E3 was, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yes, Avatar 2. It's still happening. Crazy. It is actually happening. Yeah, crazy. Uh, uh, so yes, it's Avatar The Way of Water. And uh, it seems to be Avatar, this time they're going to swim. Yep. Literally the <laughs> synopsis I've had since 2010, I think. Like, in my head. Avatar, but they go swim. Because it was known for a very long time that it was going underwater. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> so the synopsis apparently is set more than a decade after the events of the first film Avatar The Way of Water begins to tell the story of the Sully family Jake, Natiri and their kids the trouble that follows them the lengths they go to to keep each other safe the battles they fight to stay alive and the tragedies they endure uh, yeah so <laughs> I, I I think you know obviously it looks cool. They got rid of the papyrus. That was a big thing for apparently in the logo. That was a big thing for people. Um, but yes, per- Avatar 2 actually going to come out this year. Hard to believe. <laughs> it is. It actually is. In, in 3D as well. That's the other thing. The, they showed footage from the mo- from the, the movie in 3D. We're all going to be wearing glasses again this December. I, c- I just don't believe... <laughs> Because there's no other 3D movies. So that means all these cinemas are going to get sent 3D glasses solely for this movie, which is so weird. But I'm sure they've probably got a box of, like, Left over. Glasses, probably yeah, still probably. in, like, a yeah. cupboard somewhere. Yeah, I don't know. So I don't, I, don't, uh, I don't think it's that big of a stretch, but yeah. Um, yeah, so obviously some of the images leaked. They look very pretty. Kate Winslet. Kate Winslet's in this movie. Crazy. I didn't know that until this. I don't know if that was Dude, already announced. Uh, Kate Winslet, Edie Falco, Michelle Yao, Vin Diesel, Jermaine Camille, and Una Chaplin, uh, yeah. as lo- along with a slate of young actors, uh, join in the franchise. So, yeah. This releases in theaters November, December 16th. Uh, other big stories. We finally got a the official title for the next Mission Impossible film. Mission Impossible... Dead Reckoning Part 1. Uh, apparently, looks really good. <laughs> uh, they showed a teaser trailer in which, you know, uh, Tom Cruise riding a motor- motorcycle off a cliff. Uh, <laughs> as he does. Uh, I think this Are they still filming it? I don't know. No, I, they filmed this back-to-back. So both back-to-back. I think they've done, because don't forget, this is the film that Tom Cruise was filming last year when you had all those stories about him going off at people on set, telling them how lucky they were yes. to be working and they should be taking shit more serious and whatever else, you know. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, Dead Reckoning. How does that compare to the other Mission Impossible titles? It fits with the weird titles. I mean, none of the other movies. Like, a bunch of other movies have weird titles, so... Whatever, I don't really care. Dead Reckoning. Cool. They, they're all, like, out on the run. Someone's chasing them. I don't know. I don't really care. I'm very excited. All I need to know is this. You, can, <laughs> you sell me on the movie. You go, who's directing it? Christopher McQu- McQuarrie is directing it. I'm watching it. You know? And I, that's all I've known for ages. I just know that McQuarrie's doing it. It's the last two, because Tom Cruise is about 10, 72 years old. Um, so, let's go. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, they they also announced that a te- the first teaser for this movie will be released in front of Top Gun Maverick. Uh, speaking of Crazy. Top Gun Maverick, that was really that was screened in full at CinemaCon, and it's been gotten nothing but rave reviews. That's out June. No, no, it's like the, May the end of this know? month. No, wait, they moved it. Yeah, out of the end of this month. Yes, a m- movie that's been in the works forever. Uh, one critic said, Top Gun Maverick is a profound cinematic experience and easily the best film of the year. What, uh, they've done, uh, has, what they have accomplished is epic and intimate, heart-stopping, heartbreaking, however good you think it'll be, it'll be better. Well, calm down. My god, Top Gun Maverick is incredible. Return to the franchise. It's absolutely worth the wait. It honors the first Top Gun while blazing its own path in the sky. Uh, the story, acting, emotions, those dogfight sequences are excellent. Enjoy this one, my friends. Uh, yeah, 
it's it's I've seen nothing but praise for this movie. Uh, and as someone who has not seen Top Gun, but will be watching Top Gun soon because we'll likely be doing a spoiler cast before that movie. I don't know if you saw it, but I did update the spoiler cast for yeah, that week that. in the I calendar. Yes, <laughs> I was like presumptuous uh, and didn't. I was like, I don't know if I need to ask you. No, <laughs> I don't think you did. Uh, <laughs> I had it on the list anyways. Yeah. But ages so ago. I've watched Top yes. Gun. So um, I don't like Top Gun. So I was like, I'll, I'll get that out. I don't like Top Gun. I think it's um, a boring movie. I don't particularly have any fond memories of it. Um, wow, way to ruin the spoiler cast. Yeah, I mean, I'm just putting it out there as a like, <laughs> but I'm generally very excited for Maverick, um, mostly based on everything we've been seeing and hearing, and having all these people say that yes, all that shit you're seeing in the trailers, um, all your all the hype I have in my head about the the way they've shot the the planes and you know the the way that could potentially pay off in these dog fights and stuff like that and the way i'm building that up in my head to be so much like a, a magical cinematic experience i've we've never witnessed before when it comes to planes being shot and everyone's saying yes that's exactly what it is i'm going yeah fuck yeah let's go because that that's the major thing like do i care about these characters no i have no attachment to the, the first film's characters could this film make me care about the characters sure but i'm going into this because of the planes and the way they've the filmed it and the action and that's what i'm here for you know yeah so pretty excited uh yeah it sounds like it's fantastic so look forward to that later in the year uh we get our first <laughs> first look at margot robbie as barbie uh looks let me like, tell you looks like margot robbie interest- <laughs> margot robbie it looks like margot robbie she's in a pink cadillac or whatever yep. it's interesting seeing Ge- the general public who aren't on film Twitter mm. reacted to some of this stuff mm-hmm. and like being completely surprised this is a thing that's happening. Yeah. Even that was announced like two years ago. It was re- announced ages ago. People like, who's playing Ken? It's fine. Fine Gosling. Like, pay attention. That's uh, that <laughs> um, I think the interesting thing is it's being released on the same day as Oppenheimer. Obviously, Barbie being a Mar- Warner Brothers movie, Christopher Nolan not working with Warner Brothers anymore, like putting that up against that movie. Interesting. Obviously, not going to have exactly the same demographic. Not, like- not the same demographic. Oppenheimer will definitely make them all money. I'll put that out. Will there, it, though? Know. Yep, I'm going to say right now. A biopic about uh, the guy who created the atom bomb. It's not exactly. I'm telling you people who- that I'm saying that from the director of The Dark Knight and Dunkirk <laughs> will sell. Any movie. I don't know. I think this th- this is going to be an interesting thing. It's like if Oppenheimer makes money. Obviously, I don't think it's on the same budget Terry scale as those other movies, but it'd be pretty close based on the star power of, this, of all the money they're paying for cast. It's funny because like, they're just shooting that um, now. Yeah. Uh, Barbie, did they s- finish or are they still shooting? I think they're shooting. They're still shooting. Um, Either way, I'm keen for both. Obviously, they're both fantastic directors in their own right. They're very different films, very yep. different core audiences. Um, I would say general film fans should be excited for both. Um, yeah, I'm very keen to see what they do with this Barbie film because, uh, yeah, for everyone who doesn't know this movie exists and is like acting like it's going to be this like straight up Barbie movie, you know that's not what it's going to be. It's going to be. I mean, look, it may sound pretentious to say, but it's 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 going to be a feminist movie like like the easiest way to, to explain you know it's going to yeah. break down the the barbie stereotypes it's directed and, and written by greta gerwig yes yeah i think even noah i think Barbar noah involved. i think noah it's written by her and noah and she's directed yeah it, yeah so like for, for people who don't know like for, for general joe schmo who sees barbie who has no idea the type of movies they, these people those two make um they're gonna get a, a shock i think because <laughs> i know what i'm going in sort of expecting yeah, I have an idea <laughs> about like <laughs> tonally what the movie's probably going to have to say, but yeah, but yeah, pretty interesting. Uh, it's been revealed that Lionsgate is currently working on a prequel to The Hunger Games. The ballad for Song Birds and Snakes uh, is set to be directed by Francis Lawrence, who helmed uh, Catching Fire and Mock- Catching Fire, Mockingjay Part One, and Mockingjay Part Two, slated for theaters. In 2017, uh, the synopsis for the film reads, Years before he would become the tyrannical president of Pan Am, 18-year-old Cornelius Snow sees a chance for change in his fortunes when he is chosen to mentor Lucy Greybeard, the 
girl tribute for the impoverished District 12. Dylan, do you want to see a prequel to the Hunger Games where we follow the evil president? No, I think we brought this up. I think we brought this up maybe before, and I yeah, I think my answer is just no. Straight up, no, not really. I really like the Hunger Games too. Like the books, I never actually finished the films, but I've read all the books. (laughs) I really like the books. Um, I fell off the films, but there's a there's an interesting back story and universe and everything there. But is this something I particularly want to watch? No, I'd rather just watch a movie about um. Just a, a Joe Shamero new character during like the original sort of Civil War or, you know, something like that if you want to do a background, backstory sort of thing. But um, no, don't care, really. Will I watch it? Probably. Probably. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. Depends on, depends on who they cast. Yeah. I, don't. I feel like that's pretty important. Uh, but yeah, I think it's interesting, you know, finally going back to that massive property uh, in some way. You know, people love their Hunger Games. Do you watch all people those movies their, or no? The Battle Royales. Yeah, I did watch all the movies. It 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 kind of peters out, but <laughs> it's pretty clear that you know, like Jennifer Lawrence, she had enough. She wanted to move on to other things, I think. So, um, but yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see how that pans out. But that's a that was the thing that got the rounds. <laughs> uh, moving over to Sony, uh, Sony caught the most buzz i think or like got the most internet like reaction Today? for their latest entry in their spider-verse universe uh the character of el Morto will be their next uh big uh villain spider-man movie a character who has apparently been in t- two comic books two issues uh is set to come to the big screen portrayed by Puerto Rican rapper, Bad Bunny. Uh, I think we discussed about this o- offline, but uh, I think this is Sony putting their money on Bad Bunny as a performer rather than necessarily the IP of the character. Yeah, 100%. So for people who don't know I'm sure Bad it helps Bunny, to just like tra- tangentially yeah. related, but yeah. Uh, if you're like, I don't know who this person is, so he must be a nobody. Just go look up his Spotify monthly plays. Um, it's the same reason that WWE happily brought him in because he brings in a massive uh, audience outside of your small fucking English speaking country that you're listening <laughs> to this in. Um, and that, I mean, that's the truth of it. He is, he is massive uh, worldwide, but like obviously international fan base as well. Um, yeah, I, I, the fact that it's a two issue character just makes you go, they just picked the most random character that they could and was like, hey, do you want to play this I person? mean, it's fitting. <laughs> Apparently, his, uh, he comes from a long line of wrestlers oh. and he gets powers from a, uh, from like a Lucha, Lucha Libre like mask. Sure. You know what I'd love to see uh, Warner Brothers do in the next Batman movie, which we'll get to, I'm sure, in a minute maybe. I don't know. Um, but I would love to see them pick a Batman villain that was only in two issues instead of using the fucking Joker again. But yeah, I think this is, this is interesting, and I think it's interesting. Uh, it is interesting that they've gone very like actor heavy, like in this their this Spider Man verse. You know, it's like sure it's Venom, but it's Tom Hardy. Sure it's Morbius, but it's Jared Leto. Sure it's El Morto, but it's Bad Bunny. It's like they're very much. That's what's kind of leading these projects. No, the one you didn't mention is because he character. doesn't carry as much weight as the rest of them, unfortunately. <laughs> Which thought Aaron Taylor Johnson. Taylor Johnson. Johnson. Yeah, I, I feel like most people would be like, "Who's that?" And then you'd be like, "Remember um, Quicksilver in Remember Kick Ass? Yeah, or, <laughs> yeah, Kick Ass even. Oh, I mean, oh, that guy, right? Yeah, because like he's in. Um, I feel like most people don't even realize he's in. Um, uh, t- Tenet. Yeah. And most people wouldn't probably- He plays the third bro. Yeah. And most people probably didn't realize. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But yeah. I mean, the interesting thing is, it's like, man, Bullet Train must be really good because, you know, both of them in that movie, and now they've got their own leads in these Marvel (laughs) spinoffs. It's true. It's true. I mean, they pushed that release set back, motherfuckers. What? It was supposed to be out, like- Son of a bitch. Soon? Or out by now? But they pushed it back. I don't know. Uh, Yeah, so this movie is set to January 12th, 2024. No director, no other cast members. We'll see how this pans out. Uh, in sad uh, Spider-Man related news, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse has been pushed out of this year to June twenty, June 2nd, 2023, which does not bode well for me in that 
uh, fantasy draft thing we had at the start of the year. With this movie was my number one. I'm pick. doing alright because Bob's Burgers is out this week. <laughs> <laughs> I remember I picked it because I wanted the safe bet, <laughs> and, I che- and I thought it would do well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so my animation but, movie beats your animation movie. <laughs> yeah, yes. So. Uh, but we also got kind of, they retitled them. So this one is going, the second movie is Spider Man Across the Spider Verse, and the third movie in this franchise will be Spider Man Beyond the Spider Verse. Uh, they did a big presentation talking about movie and said it's going to be set, this one's going to be set in like six stitch universes. It's going to be like two hundred and something characters. It's got the biggest group team of animators on any animated project ever. But yeah, we're going to have to wait another year till we finally see it. Yeah, I'm fine. I mean, I want to watch it, obviously, but like, it's not like there's other, yeah. there's not other movies to watch. And, I mean, obviously, it just takes animation takes the time. So I think they just misjudged yeah, how does. long it was taken to get the the product they wanted. Which, get it right. You know, yeah. yeah. And I suspect they kind of want to have them, like, because of the window between them, I think, is probably the other thing. They want to make sure they can do them a year apart still. Yes, yep. that's. I think that's the key thing. So, uh, yep, there's that. Uh, we got confirmation of a bunch of sequels that are coming down the line. Venom 3 is coming. Uh, Batman 2 confirmed. And Ghostbusters will be getting another entry in the franchise. Not surprising anyway. I'm shook that they're doing a sequel to the Batman. I'm joking, I'm not, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I just, uh, I just, um, yeah, I just hope it's um, not the Joker, as my, as I was saying before. That's yeah. that's my only uh, thing. I would love. So I was thinking the other day. Here's who I want. I want Hush. I want Mister Freeze. They're my top two picks at the moment. I feel like Hush really fits the detective noir thing. No, hold on, hold on. Let me give you. Here's my actual order. Top three, like random top three. Storylines Dylan wants in the Batman movie. Batman movie. I feel like they kind of did hush. Yeah, you can do it differently. Number one, new character villain created solely for this that isn't based on anyone else. What a concept. Whoa, 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 whoa. Number two, hush. Number three, Mr. Freeze. But not Cardoony. Like, you, you got to redo it to sit that universe. Like, sort of like how they did the Riddler, obviously, but uh, which I don't have old answers to because that's, you know, but, but, but Mr. Freeze, Nora storyline, this universe. Yeah. I think, I think that would be interesting. I think I don't think they're going to go to the Joker. I think maybe maybe a tangential character, but I think... I'm you know. fine if they leave him in the background as this fucking Hannibal Lecter motherfucker that he comes Maybe, with. you know, they bring back the Riddler. It's like... Yeah. B- as another threat. I'm like, also like... The only reason I'm... S- don't love this idea of bringing back everyone is because the character I want to see continue through these movies as a background character is the penguin who I just want to see throughout the, like a trilogy mm. come to rise to the top of the, the city. That's what his TV, that's what his HBO series is for. Oh, fuck. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, it's fun to, to theorize, uh, what potentially would in the next Batman because it's coming. Um, but yeah, Venom 3, that's not surprising Thank because, you know, fuck. Venom Venom was made lots of money. Another Ghostbusters movie, again, that's not surprising. Um, well, the only, good th- right. the only good thing is that they won't bring back everyone for this one because Bill Murray's officially cancelled. I don't know if he's cancelled yet. You know? He was on my local Just- news. Well, they were talking about it on the local news here, so well, big story. I don't know. We'll see. Uh... Yeah, so those are all things. Uh, they announced that Wicked, the musical, uh, obviously the movie, the the musical set in the world of the Wizard of the Oz, uh, following the Good Witch and the Bad Witch. <laughs> Can't remember their names. Uh, they're splitting into two movies. Yeah. Uh, a mu- a musical that takes three hours uh, with an intermission is going to be made into two separate movies. See, the, it, I've seen mixed reactions to this. Like, a lot of people saying it's money grab, uh, definitely trying to get people's money, and that, why couldn't they just make it fit one movie? But, you know. Sounds horrible. I don't know. Uh, I feel like it's a wait and see thing. Like, uh, obviously, they're, they're concerned about having to cut songs and that kind of stuff, so. I don't know. 
we'll we'll see down the line. But yeah, that's an interesting piece of news. Uh, lots of other things were shown. Oh, other one. Uh, they announced the title for the A Quiet Place sequel, uh, spit off movie. Shh. A Quiet Place, day one. I don't so care. So I imagine they're gonna, it's, yeah, it's going to be when the invasion starts. I don't care because we saw it in the fucking sequel. What, mo- we, what more do you need to show me from day one? Like the second one flashes back and shows you. How did you- everybody else react? Well, so like spoilers okay. for part two because you're never going to watch this film. And for people listening, if you haven't watched it by now, like skip ahead, I guess. But like they show like... um. What's his name? Krasin- Krasinski. Right, yeah, John Krasinski and um, Emily Blunt. Like, so he's out doing chores or whatever. She's at this, like, football game or whatever, baseball or some shit with the kids. Um, then, like, d- you know, shit flies from the sky or whatever. They're like, what the hell's going on? Next second, like, alien, you know, monster thing jumps out everywhere. It's like, oh, shit, better all around. It's the only Murphy's characters there because they're like, better set him up in the flashback so it makes sense when he shows up later. <laughs> um, then, you know, like, they're all running around crazy, go to get in the car, shit's going off, hiding away. Like, it's everyone's getting killed left right yeah like the, i've seen this what more do you need to show me from that it's fine I, I don't need to see more so and considering yeah i'm like is it different characters at least like what are we showing me more of emily blunt in day one i saw fucking what happened to her um and then if they the way the second one ended left it open for a sequel to take place after that one so i don't know why we're now going backwards again like come on Pissing me off with this, trying to drain <laughs> as much money out of this franchise as they can. Uh, yeah, so lots of other movies showing off at CinemaCon. Uh, if you want to highlight uh, Wonka, obviously the the prequel, Star- Charlie and the Chocolate Factory prequel film following Willy Wonka, played by Chil- Timothy Chalamet. Looking forward to watching uh, this film about this slaver. <laughs> Probably it's fun. <laughs> it's going to be fun and musical. Uh <laughs> People have been swinging the name Paddington around, but that's purely purely because it's being directed by Paul King. Uh, this is coming out Christmas next year, so it is ages away. Um, of course, don't worry, your darling has got a trailer during the thing uh, during CinemaCon. Live your wild, eh? Uh, yeah, so that that one's out soon. And, but of course, that got overshadowed by a yellow envelope. Uh, we got news of David O. Russell's new film. It's titled Amsterdam and is obviously starring Christian Bale, Marco Robbie, John David Washington, Rami Malek, Chris Rock, Zoe Saldana, Anya Taylor-Joy, huge cast. Don't know anything about the plot. The very out-of-context scene was shown. Just looking forward to hearing about the horrible David Russell yelling at people on set stories that come out after. Absolutely. Uh, Julia Roberts and George Clooney have teamed up for a new rom-com called Ticket to Paradise that's coming this year. Uh so uh, she said a book a movie based on the book she said breaking the sexual harassment story that helped ignite a movement by Megan Twoe Twoe and Jodie Cantor uh it's a movie about the story about the women who broke the story about Harvey Weinstein's harassment in Holly of women in Hollywood bringing the Me Too movement already in motion to the front and center of the world stage starring Carrie Mulligan and Zoe Kazan uh that'll be interesting uh also first images from Babylon uh, Demi Chazelle's new film starring Margot Robbie, Brad Pitt, and Olivia Wilde set in the 1920s during the movie fr- industry's transition from silent films to talkies, the rise and fall of fictional and historical characters figure into Let's fucking go! Yep, so that one's Boxy Day, I think, off the top of my head. Keen Bean. Uh, also had Armageddon Time at Astrid G- James Gray's next film uh, starring Anthony Hopkins and Hathaway and Jeremy Strong, which is an 80s period piece set in Queens where Grey grew up and is billed as a deeply personal coming of age story about the strength of family and the generational pursuit of the American dream. That's just going to be Oscar nominated. Uh, That's my prediction right now, by the way. Okay. And this is maybe the most crazy movie that I only learned about through CinemaCon. Have you heard of about Violent Night? Yes. <laughs> so... David Harbour is going to play Santa, who uh, has to fight off a group of mercenaries who break into somebody's house on Christmas Eve. I think I read about it. Mm, maybe near the start of the year, I think. Yeah, probably. I don't know if it was been... I don't know why or where, but it was on like a bloody disgusting or something, so that's probably not a website you have, probably in, not. have in your repertoire. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a regular resource. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm keen for this. Uh, Sounds great. Yeah. 
something to look forward to this Christmas season. It's a yeah. bit different. I love these you fucked know, up definitely. adult horror Christmas movies. David Harbour playing Santa Claus is a get like great because you know they're going to make him look like big and strong like he looks in um, Stranger Things, like um, or even like a Black Widow. Like he looks, you know, he looks yeah. strong, and you can shoot him that way. Um, I just think it's just going to be yeah. If they do it right, I think this could be a, a, like a sort of a classic sort of a adult Christmas movie. That's the potential to be anyway. Yeah, absolutely. So there, yeah, that's everything I thought was worth talking about from CinemaCon. Uh, lots of things to look forward to for the rest of the year. Cinema's back. Cinema's back. I'm meaning like a month because nothing's coming to my fucking cinema, but all these movies are out. Yay! <laughs> Fucking I love mean, it. Yeah, that's rough. Hey, cinema, can I give you money? No, there's nothing we want to show. All right, bye then. Right, come back and watch Batman again. Oh, uh, <laughs> still got Spider Man on. They still got Spider Man. Yeah, Spider Man, Batman on. Doctor Strange is about coming out. Then I'll just show that. It's not part superhero movies. Fucking dry man. Well, I mean, I go watch them all, so I'm part problem. But I mean, right. some of them are good, I guess. But uh, another big story this week. Netflix. Netflix shares plummeted in their to the lowest point since January 2018 as investors reacted to the stream's first subscriber loss in more than a decade, bringing years of booming growth to a screeching halt. Uh, Netflix shares sank to more than a four-year low after the company posted a Q1 loss of 200,000 subscribers and projected that it will lose another 2 million subscribers in quarter two, prompting a wave of analyst downgrades. Netflix shares have shared 65% of their value over the last six months. Uh, yeah, so 200,000, they've lost 200,000 subscribers in the first three months of the year. Obviously, a little bit of that is offset because they can't, they've stopped Netflix in Russia. Uh, but, you know, this is crazy that this is the first time they've ever lost more users than they've gained. Uh, there's been a lot of, like, it seems like there's been like a bit of a knee jerk reaction, uh, where they've shut, cancelled a bunch of animated projects, uh, particularly uh, Bone, which was one that's been in the works for a long time and has been uh, lot based on the Jeff, Jeff Smith comic book series and has long been desired by fans. They also cancelled a uh, Roald Dahl adaptation of the Twits and a series called called Toll Toll and Trouble. Um, those have all been cancelled. They've also had wide can't like wide layoffs of the team, the to dumb team that they put together only like six months ago, uh, which has caused a lot of strife within the media community because they're all upset that all these they uh, like wooed all these people away from big high long term jobs uh, with a lot of money to come work for them, and then they've laid them off off six months later. Uh, Dylan, does this signal the end for Netflix? <laughs> no. Although it's interesting. Um, they're always running at a loss. They'll have to reevaluate, I guess, make some changes. Uh, why are people unsubscribing? Is their current content not enough to keep people constantly subscribed? Do they need to switch to the binge it model in a way to keep people sticking around, maybe switch some stuff to weekly as much as that goes against what Netflix has always done? You know, like I'm sure these discussions can be made, but I would say maybe it's just like, they haven't had enough major big TV stuff uh, come out recently that the majority, like a Stranger Things or a um, Orange is New Black or um, what else is really big? The Queen. Um, no, what's that called? The Crown. The Crown. <laughs> About the Queen. All those ones that are like mass hits for Netflix. I would say there's not. Like they have, they always have a lot coming out, and I know we talk about a lot of stuff, and we watch, you know, a lot of it's stuff. It's mandatory. Yeah, it's mandatory. Um, but I would say there hasn't been, if you're looking at like the last twelve months, where where have those things been to keep people around? If you know what I mean. I think it's interesting. I feel like a lot of this is due to them losing a lot of the content that they had to other streamers that have picked mm. up. Like obviously losing friends, I feel like. Mm. That was a big hit and would explain. And then losing The Office as well. I think those are two shows that people got streaming services for because, you know, they just love to watch those shows mm. again, 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 again. So, the, the, um, but then do you just say that this is something they should look at and there's like, 
it's just there was a point where they ruled the streaming market because they they didn't have any competition and now that everyone else has spent the years and whatever getting their streaming service worked out and then finally launching it this is just a like there's no what this is a loss that was just couldn't be it's inescapable it was going to happen eventually yeah it's an inescapable there loss was, there's going to be a ceiling yeah that goes from them ruling the streaming market to now more people there thus they're going to lose some subscribers and at which point it's like yeah especially when they're losing content Mm. um and like there isn't a there's there's very few and far between like must see netflix series i would argue Mm. like wide stream wide mainstream hits even though obviously we had Squid Game, which became a phenomenon, yeah. um, and that kind of stuff. So, I mean, they still can put out stuff like that. It's just like harder and in between. Apparently, there's been a lot of like uh, changes at the top of the company and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, there's that woman that just, left. Or yeah, fired to, her or I whatever. think. Yeah, the, it seems like that was a big turning point, uh, quality wise, uh, and that kind of thing, or direction wise. Um, yeah, I just I guess it'll be interesting to see whether this is just a blip in the road or whether they're they're going to have to make big changes and like be more sensible about their spending. Um, uh, you know, not just give a bunch of money to make uh, crazy projects and spend millions and millions of dollars trying to get Academy Awards. Hmm. Um, I feel like you know they'll be fine. I don't think Netflix is going anywhere, but uh, there's only so far they could have grow before, you know. And they they haven't done themselves any favors press wise, uh, going on about password sharing and that kind of stuff. I think, and obviously they've had several price rises in the last however long. Uh, now they're talking about bringing it in ad supported mode. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's. It'll be in- it's going to be interesting to see what Netflix does in the next 12 months. How yeah, they kind of react to this set, the- this kind of first setback ever. And like, what sort of changes they make. Hopefully it isn't just, let's just stop, make- let's just make less content. Unless it's like, let's make less content, but let's make sure everything's better. It works for Apple. It's true. They've got nothing but hits, mostly. <laughs> so, yeah. That's been... That that's one of the big stories of the week, uh, Dylan. I know this is going to be hard to discuss, but uh, we need to talk about it. Justin Lin has exited as director of Fast X. Fast X being the latest Fast and Furious film. If you haven't, don't know, because <laughs> it, it's it's not very clear here. With filming underway at, on Fast X, Deadline has learned that Justin Lin is stepping down as director on the next installment in the Fast and Furious franchise, just days into production. Lin Crow wrote the film with Dan Mezu and will remain on as a producer. While the parting was amicable between both parties, insiders say that Lin ultimately decided to step away from the franchise due to creative differences. Lin has released a statement on this, his decision to leave the film. With the support of Universal, I have made the decision to step back as director of Fast X, uh, while remaining with the project as a producer, over 10 years and five films, we've been able to shoot the best actors, the best stunts, and the best damned car chases. On a personal note, as a child of Asian immigrants, I'm proud of being able to build the most diverse franchise in movie history. I will forever be grateful to the amazing cast, crew, and studio for their support and for welcoming into the Fast family. Production or had just begun on the 10th installment, and while the film will continue shooting some second unit footage, Insiders say production will take a brief pause while execs and producers look to find Lynn's replacement. Dylan, what the hell is going on? <laughs> I don't know. It's very weird. Um, creative differences is just such an evergreen, like, over, like, you could, could be anything. Um, everyone's, like, everyone's going to the... In shooting. Yeah. Everyone's going to the that blame Vin Diesel, which, I mean, it could be his fault, bro, we know. <laughs> Fucking, um, he <laughs> does have sort of an iron claw on the franchise, and that's well known. Um, there was already a story prior to this where apparently in the original script, Jordana Brewster's character wasn't in it, and Vin was like, no, nah, she's got to be in it. Forces them to add her in. So, I mean, there are... and add on the, the rock Dwayne Johnson you know all that sort of stuff in the past it, yeah it's well known Vin Diesel has like he like sort of back chair directs writes the uh yeah. direction of this franchise 
But I mean, he's worked with him before, so I just don't know how, like several times. So I just don't know how any of that would be different this time around, to be honest. I don't know, like, what could be so bad um, that makes him want to think, change. I will, will say that the fact, so the fact that the press release was really not released by him, but on the Fast and Furious or the Universe or whatever it was channel means that he like told them they had enough time to like craft this thing and then release it through their channels, which yeah, it does, it does play very amicably, not like fake amicably, if you know what I mean? Like mm. it does play out. Like he went to them and like said, this is what's happening. Like, just give you a heads up. I think this is the way we're going to go. Um, which is interesting. Uh, I read another report where people are saying it's going to be costing them 600,000 to a million dollars a day at the moment. Because of course they're going, they're like productions halted. Keeping crew and cast, they're, yeah, they're keeping crew and cast and big cast names, um, including like the newly announced cast members like Jason Momoa and um, Brie Larson, which we don't know how much either of them are, you know, like how involved. But apparently, you know, at least Jason Momoa we expect to be a big Brie Larson. I don't know, but everyone else as well, core cast, um, they're paying to stick around. So six hundred thousand to a million dollars a day. They're going to want to get a new director as fucking fast as possible. Um, it is very weird. It's not something here have often. Obviously I was hugely disappointed because I'm a big fan of, um, Lynn and Dustin Lynn. yeah, he does all the, he's directed all of the best entries into the franchise. He saved the franchise. He turned the franchise into the money making machine that it is today. I don't think that's arguable. Um, people may, people who love the first one and hate the rest would say that he ruined the franchise. I guess he still turned, whatever he turned it into the direction the franchise went in that made, made it what it is today. That the biggest, one of the biggest earning movie franchises of all time. Um, that's him. That is a hundred percent all on, um, him doing that. So, um, and he revitalized the franchise and brought it back. So he just, just he deserves a lot more respect. And um, yeah, very disappointed when I saw this. But, you know, like if it's um, whatever's best for him and I guess like his mental health ultimately, because if he was going to be working through conditions that were upsetting to him or something like that, then, you know, can't be helped. But yeah, disappointing for sure. Yeah, I mean, this is crazy considering it's probably one of the biggest films making being made at the moment. A uh, couple of days into shooting, it's like, how does something like this happen is like how do you get to this point and then decide i guess mm. um but yeah hopefully it all pans out and works for everybody uh i guess you know hopefully we get justice for han in this <laughs> uh but you know he, ca- figured, he came back you know, gave justice for han and then has left so <laughs> i he didn't really get justice well, he brought him back he saved him from that he came back wasted death did you get justice he was the tiniest person on the poster, is all I'm saying. He got a whole poster. He got a whole trailer, basically, though. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, speaking, we're talking about this. Let's let, let's mix things up. Let's talk about this week's top three. Definitely in the top three. They're crazy. Uh, we're going to help Universal Pictures out. Uh, this week's top three is top three directors who should replace Justin Lin on Fast X. Uh, this is an idea that you were not on board with at first, but I think so. You've got a few. You've had a few days to like get used to the idea of Justin Lin not directing the next film. Uh, so yeah, how about you kick things off with your number three? My number three is Elizabeth Banks. Wow, I really could not think of many people like this. I went through a bunch of action franchises, obviously trying to think of people who would be good for this. And to be honest, most of them I would hate to touch Fast and Furious. I just don't like this style. So I was looking at other people, you know, like, um, I don't know if any of these people end up on your list, but um, uh, Old Mate who did, like, The Kingsman and shit like Oh, fuck, what's his? Matthew Vaughn. Matthew Vaughn. Yeah. You know, I'm looking at, the, I'm, I'm just thinking of big action franchises. And every single I go through one, I'm like, nah, nah, nah. They're just like, I just don't. And again, like, I'm also thinking, like, Matthew Vaughn always plays very, like, uh, guy gaze heavy you know got like i feel like he would completely fuck up any of the female characters and that's the other thing that sort of i always keep an eye on i feel like the especially the last film and majority of the films fast and furious is um female characters for the most part like m- not even grand but they're always like pretty good but so um, a lot of action directors i'm like nah they would like f- like ruin the female characters and all this sort of stuff so ended up i'm like charlie's angels is pretty good Will can she shoot the action stuff? That was the one complaint. The fight scenes, right? Still, a bit more experience, maybe helping hand. Still, second unit does the fight scenes. I don't know. 
But I feel like for the most part, would be an interesting choice. And I wouldn't hate it. So number three, Elizabeth Banks. All right. My number three, Brad Bird. Uh, obviously well known for his work at Pixar, doing the Incredibles films. D- did the Iron Giant. Uh, but remember, he directed Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol, one of the great Mission Impossible movies. Um, sure, he had a bit of a miss with his last live action film, Tomorrowland. Uh, but, you know, the the potential's there. And I think, you know, he's definitely somebody who could come in and do the job. Uh, yeah, you know, give him another shot. Big, big production, like set world that's already been established. Characters have already been established. Uh, yeah, I think I think he would be a solid choice to come in and uh, continue the franchise. Dylan, what's your number two? My number two is the co-team of Adil El Arbi and Bilal Fella. Um, the two people who uh, did Bad Boys Forever and uh, currently shooting the Batgirl movie and I think they're doing a handful. I don't know actually how many of Miss Marvel, but... I think they did two episodes. Okay. So some of that as well. But obviously that's upcoming. Well, that, the, my pick is based solely on Bad Boys for Life because that's the only movie of theirs I've actually seen. Uh, but I actually really enjoyed Bad Boys for Life. I thought it was very fun. I enjoyed the way they shot the action. I enjoyed the way they shot those two characters. I think that... Um, you could almost look at Michael Bay as a good pick for Fast and Furious, but I would automatically be like, no, 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 no. But then I look at these two and go, actually, they they like toned down the the Michael Bay ness of the Bad Boys films while still keeping the the similar similarities between the franchise, which is obviously having characters that you know banter a lot and sort of a, a fun vibe and you know ridiculousness that um, that these films can reach. But um, yeah, so I'm going with um, them. Would be a good pick even though they're quite busy at the moment, but I'm not taking that into account in any of my picks. Just like, I'm just going with, yeah, whatever I think would work. Uh, my number two is Gina Prince Bythworth. Bythwood. Uh, most recent work that people would have seen was The Old Guard, a film starring Charlize Theron, where she plays like a, a model. Uh, but she's also got uh, The Woman King, Starring Viola Davis, which has got a, got a lot of positive buzz behind it. Um, you know, I think she's a solid action director um, based on what I saw in The Old Guard. Uh, it has a history in a lot more drama uh, films. Uh, so, you know, can do a lot of the like character work that you do see in these Fast and Furious movies that are kind of soap opery at a certain deg- to a certain amount. Uh, yeah, I think she would be a solid pick to come in. Uh, and continue J- what well, Justin Lin in that script, you know. Yeah, so that's my number two. Dylan, who would be your number one pick to replace Justin Lin on Fast X? My number one may be a boring answer, but it's the only right one in a snow. And again, someone who is currently busy, I think, but that's fine. James Wan, director of uh, Fast and Furious 7, uh, is in my mind the, if if he could... Um, cause he's currently in post of, um, Aquaman, but if he could take a break from that to come do this, that is probably the easiest answer, especially in this scenario where he's having to go straight to set. He's having to fit straight into that mold and get shit going. So ideally you actually want someone who's already worked within the environment, knows the cast, knows potentially some of the crew, knows the general vibe and everything like that. You kind of want someone who's already worked on the franchise and he's the only person I would want to return as a director. I don't, I (laughs) furious eight. I don't want F Gary Gray to return Rob Cohen. I don't want to return director of the first one. He's like, you know, he's been accused of a bunch of, like sexual allegations and stuff at the moment. So no, get the get out of here. I can't even remember who directed Too Fast Too Furious. Um, the that's that's the only person I care about. I I I, I just want um yeah James Wan. James Wan number one pick. My number one pick, Kerry Goji Fukunaga, the director of James Bond No Time to Die, has clearly has some history with car chases. Uh. Did a fantastic job with that movie. I think you could come in and do a job uh, finishing this movie off. Uh, obviously, that movie proved he can do big budget 
action movies. I think it would be a solid choice. Uh, obviously, he's got his own style in that, but I think you know he could fit fit in the fit it in potentially. I think he'd be an interesting choice. But yeah, I think yeah. I don't think he's likely. <laughs> I think uh, I don't think your choice is likely either. It seems like they're probably. I don't know who they're going to go with, to be perfectly honest. But yeah, I think we've I think we've provided some pretty good options, if possible. So yeah, I actually think James Wan is legit the best answer, and I, is someone that they would try and get. Out of all that list, there's no uh, solely for the reason I was saying that he knows the. I think so. Like th- that's because obviously he's connected to them because of the experience on Fury yeah. Seven and like that whole production. Uh, I mean the other. T- if you can't get James Wan, I mean, you could get Lee Winnell. I mean, that's <laughs> that, that was on my list. I mean, it's like... He doesn't, you know he doesn't work right? on the franchise. Like, <laughs> he doesn't actually follow around James Wan. They I mean. don't? They're not no. joined at the hip? Since, no. Since, since, I know since. if you know, but Lee Winnell's been doing his own movies. Yeah. All right. There you go. Uh, let us know your top threes uh, on Twitter. Who would you want? But yeah. Let us know universal if you pick one of our people and we expect some like royalties a, a signing fee or something yeah invitation to the premiere plane tickets hotel <laughs> admin cast interviews all right let's <laughs> that'd be nice yes uh let's jump into this week's thumbs of trailers of course you can find all of the tra- links to all the trailers that we're talking about this week in the show notes below or in the notes part of the podcast app that you're using to listen to this got him got him all right first trailer for this week on the count of three uh directed by jared carmichael starring Joe carmichael christopher abbott tiffany haddish jb smooth lavelle crawford and henry winkler val and kevin two chronically depressed best friends make a pact to end each other's life when their daily's done but as the two spend the day wrapping up their affairs, the volatile Kevin's need to confront his trauma sends their orderly plans spiraling out of control. Uh, Dylan, did you know about this movie before I dropped the trailer on you? No, I remember seeing. I'd never watched the trailer. I never looked up what it's about. I remember Sundance seeing the title and people saying it's really good. So, what was your first reaction when the first thing you see is a, uh, a notice about uh, suicide? <laughs> Um, uh, prevention line and support. I don't know. I was just like, what a weird, I was like, oh, yeah. right. I'm, I, I was just like, I'm about to watch something that's not funny, I guess, but then it proceeds to be quite funny. So <laughs> it's like sort of a weird, you know, cause you see that notice and your brain goes oh, serious, like serious shit, you know, like that's like, if you're giving notes about suicide prevention, this isn't something to laugh about. And then the trailer proceeds to make you laugh. So it's quite, yeah, I mean, I really like this trailer. I'm very keen for this movie. I think this looks great. Uh, it's also just, I think, probably the bleakest you could go with dark comedy. Like, I don't know if you could go darker than this. <laughs> like, it yeah. literally has a scene for people who haven't watched the trailer where two people, like, if you're listening to this and watch the trailer, literally has a scene where they're both pointing guns at each other's heads and they're like, that's what it's called on the count of three because they're counting down three, two, one, and they're going to shoot. But the last second, one of them, like, pushes the gun out of the way. It fires anyway, so he nearly killed him. Um, and then the plot of the movie is literally, yeah, from there, let's spend one day trying to, you know, do the last thing. I can sort of predict, well, I presume I can predict, like, the message and the idea of the movie based on where it's going to go. But even if it goes that direction, I'm fine with it because it's doing it in a way that I definitely haven't seen. And, yeah, it's, like, mm. it's looks like it's tre- it's both treating the mental health stuff quite serious while also, yeah, being a comedy, which is sort of a fine line, I guess, to go with at times. But um, both the uh, actors look great in this. Um, yeah, I'm very keen. Tiffany Haddish is um, showing up in a lot, and she's great in everything I've seen her show up in, like, the last couple of years. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm keen. I like this. Double thumbs up. Yeah, there's two thumbs up from me. Um, yeah, this Jared Carmichael, I feel, is having a moment. Like, I uh, saw him obviously hosting SNL recently. He had a special come out. Uh, obviously, he's got this movie. Uh, so, yeah, I'm keen to watch it. Uh, looks very funny, despite the very bleak, dark. Yeah. That part at the end that matter. plays into, like, where it fades out to black in the trailer. <laughs> I was like, uh, there's. Yeah, these yeah. like the last words bit 
because we watched a red band trailer yeah. as well. I guess it's worth pointing out. I think it's only a red band. No, trailer, I saw another so. one. I saw in the recommended. There's oh, a okay. normal trailer as well. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so this one is coming to the US May thirteenth. No Australian release. Looking forward to watching it in December at the earliest. Who knows if we'll ever be able to watch it because it is dark. Next trailer. Dashcam, directed by Rob Savage, starring Annie Hardy. At the start of the pandemic, an indulgent and self-deluded live-streaming improv musician abandons LA for London, steals her ex-bandmate's mates, her ex-bandmate's car, and makes the wrong decision to give an elder a ride to an elderly woman who is not what, what she seems. Uh, Dylan, what do you think of Dash Camp? Um, I'm going two thumbs down on the trailer. I think it's a hectic mess that gives you no idea what the fuck's going on and if you would care to watch this. I am, however, going to watch this because it's from the director of The Host, or Host, The Host, Host, whatever it was, um, which I quite enjoyed, uh, which was a COVID-made, you know, webcam movie thing that released on Shutter. Uh, so I'm watching it solely because of that, but I'm going double f- thumbs down on this. It's just a very messy trailer that nothing for me. I have no, I have no idea what's going on, and not in a good way. Like, I'm just like... Wh- what like not what the fuck is going on like i just and i'm sure maybe the movie will make more sense i don't know but yeah i'll, I'll, I'll watch it two thumbs down uh i think i'll give it one up one down i think you know Fucking it sets up the premise reasonably well uh but yeah there's a lot there and it's like it, it does escalate which i think it does make for a good trailer um but yeah, it's not something I'll be watching. Uh, <laughs> you like giving a high rating uh, to me, and then pres- you're like, you're not going to watch it either. Proceed to go. No, I'm not going to watch yeah, yeah. it. Uh, that's a, you know, I, it's difficult to rate things that you have no intention of watching. Uh, I'm like, I'm going to watch this two thumbs down. <laughs> I'm not going to watch this one up, one down. It makes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me don't don't rating change. Me. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think you know, I think. I'm I'm curious how it's all going to play out and like if it's going to be real time is it going to because obviously it's got like the full comments on it on the screen and everything uh from what I read somewhere it's only like 66 minutes long uh so it's actually yeah. shorter than Spree that one I watched with um uh Joe Carey in it remember which was yeah. uh similar sort of thing although it sounds like the plot's very different that was him live streaming literally being like i'm gonna kill people like <laughs> well i'm an uber yeah. driver and then they start like live streaming so this will be released in theaters and on demand on june 3rd in the u.s no release date or it's options here i mean the trailer says it's gonna end up yeah the trailer says in theaters and on demand i would presume based on the past this will end up on shutter probably obviously blumhouse production and the host came out and shut up. The host came out and shut up, but even if it is, doesn't end up in shut up. The fact that, yeah, even in the US they're doing in theaters and on demand um, just means, okay, well, it'll just go straight to on demand here. I'll just pay money to watch it, right? Would you actually want to see this in a theater? No. I'd go watch it, but is this a movie where I'm like, I need to see this in a the theater? No. If it was showing in a the theater, would I go watch it? Yes. Okay. I would, but I don't think it's a movie I need to watch in the, in the theater. And interestingly, I even said host when I watched it was actually a movie I think is better watched on a laptop because the way it's, it happens. With a laptop. Yeah. And the way it's all shot and everything, I actually think that movie would be scarier to watch on a laptop than in a cinema. I think it's more, it's probably more engaging that way. So what you're saying is you should watch this movie on your phone. I think you should watch this in a car while you're driving on your phone. Don't take anything I just said. Not while you're driving. Please. Not while you're driving. Just to clarify, please. Be in the passenger seat. Yeah, okay, that's fine. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Next trailer, The Big Con. Con has two ends. Directed by James Lee Hernandez and Brian Lazaret. Uh, Eric C. Con was a lawyer living a little too large in eastern Kentucky until two whistleblowers realized he was at the center of a government fraud worth over half a billion dollars, one of the largest in U.S. history. And that was just the beginning. So this is a new documentary series coming to Apple TV+. Plus. Dylan, what did you think of the trailer? I watched the trailer actually the other day before you... This was the ones I'd already watched. 
because I saw it pop up and I watched it. I was like, this looks really good. And I looked up who was doing it and it's like from the people who did McMillions. I was like, I watch McMillions. That was very good. Um, so yes, I'm keen for this. Long story short, two thumbs up. Don't know who this guy is. Never heard of him before. Trailer doesn't spoil everything. Definitely seems like he lives a wild life. No idea if he's dead, alive, in jail, what's going on. Not going to Google it. It's out in like a couple weeks. I can survive. Um, not to have that and just go in, go in not knowing. Uh, but yes, McMillan's is very good. This double thumbs up looks good. Going to watch it. Yeah, this is double thumbs up for me. I think it's well cut together trailer. Uh, like I said, I, it sets up the premise of this crazy scenario of somebody being able to steal half a billion dollars. Uh, and his name is Con. Mm. It was on the writing. Like, the writing was on the wall. You you could, know? Like, the writing was on the wall, literally. Uh, so, um, really well put together, and it seems like they've got a wide swath of interviewees. Um, so, yeah, I'm pretty keen. Two thumbs up for me. This is coming to Apple TV Plus May 6th. So, not far away. So, I can wait. Not far away at all. Uh, next trailer Fire Island. Directed by Andrew Ahn, starring Joel Kim Booster, Bowen Yang, Conrad Rickamora, and Margaret Cho. Two best friends embark on a week-long vacation to Far Island, the famous gay escape destination off the southern core of Long Island, accompanied by cheap rosé and a small group of e- eclectic friends. Bill, what do you think of this trailer? I'm going to one up, one down. Um, it's, I, I think it looks unique enough uh, cast-wise. I'd like that it's not a bunch of white dudes because I feel like quite often uh, that's still one point when you're like sort of going representation wise. Quite often the big LGBT uh, movies, uh, Hollywood ones are quite often just white people. So I think that's sort of a good point of view for it. I've never heard of this place, but Googling apparently it's a real place. So that was also yes. another interesting factoid. Um, but I'm going one up, one down. I when they get into the whole what the was it the gay nerds versus the gay frat boys? Like what's the you know what I mean? Like what's the, that sort of thing? I'm like oh that's a bit weird. I don't know if that's fun, but um, the cast seem fun, lively. I'm um, yeah, I'm going to watch it. But yeah, one up, one down for the trailer. I'll go. Yeah, this is one up, one down for me as well. I think uh, I like people in the the. <laughs> The cast, uh, Bo and Yang, obviously, is a breakout hit on SNL, uh, and it's been a few other things. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, I'm intrigued, apparently reading up, apparently it's based on, it's a modern retelling of Pride and Prejudice. Uh, so kind of going into it with that, it's like, oh, that kind of is, is an interesting twist on that story. Uh, I can't imagine going Austin would have imagined no. a bunch of Asian me- gay men. <laughs> No. <laughs> uh, in a film adaptation of her books uh, but yeah it looks interesting it looks like it'll be a fun time uh, but yeah it, it's not super wowy I don't think so yeah this one is coming to it's meant to be coming to Disney Plus uh, June 3rd 2022 so it's releasing on Hulu in the States and releasing on Disney Plus everywhere I just won't say gay in the movie yeah. <laughs> it's going to be heavily edited down. Yeah. 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 All right. Uh, final trailer for this week. Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. Directed by Helena Rain. Uh, starring Amanda Hestenberg, Maria, Bac- Maria Bakalova, Pete Davidson, Rachel Sano, Mahala Harold, Chase Sue Wonders, and Lee Pace. When a group of rich 20-somethings plan a hurricane party at a remote family mansion, a party game turns deadly in this fresh and funny look at backstabbing fake friends and one party gone very, very wrong. Uh, Dylan, what would you think of Bodies, Body Bodies? Very, very keen. Double thumbs up. I didn't watch the as much as I tried. I just saw the A24 logo and backed out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, love, I really like a bunch of the cast. I think um, the setup is funny i think it's very obvious that this is a tongue-in-cheek horror comedy whatever you want to call it um the characters all look terrible but in a way that's going to be fun to watch them argue and die i guess is the the <laughs> right way yeah one way to put it yeah um 
Pete Davidson has quite a few funny bits in this. Um, yeah, I'm keen. I, 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 I'm definitely keen. Double thumbs up. Yeah, this is two. Yeah, I'll give it two thumbs up as well. I think it's a stylish, fun A twenty four ish trailer. Um, well cut together, like make, making fun of like kind of the woke talk that some of the kids have. <laughs> the best uh, line. Just, I just remember the best line. I've only watched the trailer once, but the best line is. Did you just shoot me? Oh, of course you'd make this all about you. <laughs> <laughs> so shocking. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, Pete Davidson has funny lines. Lee Pace, obviously playing as a very older guy yeah. compared to everybody else, like full beard um, and all the, against all these young people. Very interesting juxtaposition. Uh, yeah, it could be a potentially interesting whodunit, but also slasher film. It's an A24 slasher is literally, it's like, it just looks like a slasher, but with a twist like a weird twist on it so it's not like like you can make this movie like in any other word if this movie is just played straight where it's like oh it's a sleepover party and then there's a killer you know that's just a slasher but the twist is that they're playing a game and it's a whodunit which of them's actually the like taking the game the a step further while having all this who is Ghostface? yeah who's yeah. Ghostface? while also having this meadow commentary for shits and gigs on top yeah <laughs> All right. So, yes, uh, Bodies, Bodies, Bodies releases in the US on August 5th. Who knows when it's going to release in Australia? A24 films are paying the butt. Yeah. Why didn't A24 just put it straight into my veins? Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, well, that brings us to the end of this week's episode of What Do You Want to Watch? Let us know what do you th- which, what thumbs are you giving these trailers? What are you, who are your top three directors that you would pick to replace Justin Lin or Fast X? Um, let, let us know on Twitter by going to explosion.com slash Twitter or jump into our Discord at explosion.com slash Discord. If you want to help us out here, what do you want to watch? Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or on Podchase or tell people about the show or leave us five stars anywhere you can leave five stars. And if you like this episode, thoughts worth a dollar, head on over to our Kofi page at explosionnetwork.com slash support. You can leave a donation for as little as a dollar. Uh, of course, you go to explosionnetwork.com for all our news reviews and a multitude of other podcasts. Especially look out for our Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness spoiler cast over on all new Marvel casts this week. Uh, that's where we'll be talking about that movie. Uh, yeah. So thank you very much for listening. Until next time, keep watching stuff, I guess.